Well, first I want to thank uh, Russ and Jerry for arranging for me to be here. I've, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. And Philippians, I think, is a good choice. Uh, Philippians has been one of Christianity's favorite books for about 2,000 years. Uh, you might remember some of the favorite verses from it. There are several, you know, uh, have this mind in you which is in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, press on toward the prize of the upward calling. I mean, the, uh, <clears throat> my calculations are not scientific, but I believe there are more quotable verses per square inch in Philippians than any other New Testament writing. I mean, it's everybody's favorite book. A and people say uh, it was probably Paul's favorite church. You read 1 Corinthians, and it's rather obvious that would hardly be on his number one list. Uh, and some of the others, he starts off Galatians, you stupid Galatians. <laughs> I mean, uh, but you read Philippians, and it's like, uh, uh, it's almost like too mushy. The first five or six verses, it's like, I just can't wait to be with you. I love you. Every time I pray, I think of you. I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of gooey in a way. Uh, but but it's, a, it's, a, it's a favorite book, and we face a little bit of a choice about how to read it. And one, day to, one way to read Philippians is a, a common way. You pick your favorite verses. Now, tonight and tomorrow morning, we could just do favorite verses, and that is one way, but I don't think that's the way we want to go. Uh, I have had students who, instead of studying Philippians, decided to pray and wait for a, a message. And while that may be a favorite way to do devotional, it uh, certainly didn't pass exams. Uh, and, and I'm not quite sure that Paul, when he wrote this letter, wanted people to say, oh, here's a letter. Let's pray and see if maybe there's something we can learn from it. You know, I mean, it's a letter. It's a letter to a church. Uh, it, it was written to help some people who lived 2,000 years or so ago to deal with a, an issue, a, a, a problem, in fact. Uh, it's a very serious book. Uh, the seriousness of it we'll get into tomorrow morning because it'll become very apparent. But I, I think to read a book like this or a letter like this, we have to first of all admit that it was not written to us. It was written to some other people who had another problem. They had other ways of living. They used another language. They, it was a completely different world back there. And to read this letter, it's as though we need to do that. I, I have recently been going through boxes that have followed through the various move I have made in my life, uh, I ran into two boxes of love letters written by my mother and father. They saved each other's love letters in the 1930s. This was before the Vietnam War. Okay? <laughs> this was before World War II. You know, th this was on back there a ways. And when you read some of that language and some of their concerns, it's almost like, why are you concerned about that? Well, that's because you and I don't live with England being bombed. We don't live in a world where a guy named Hitler was raising things. You know, we just don't live in that world. We live in our world. We have other people raising those issues. And we have some similar concerns. Uh, our people are in the military, and, and so were theirs. And, and, but we have to go back to read my mother and father's love letters in a very different world. Uh, and that's kind of what we want to do with Philippians here. So if you'll permit me for a moment, uh, Jerry has distributed a kind of a tentative chronology of things in the uh, early Christian world the first century of it. Uh, we're going to just walk down through that very briefly.
to put this letter in a little bit of context. Now, in, in, uh, uh, in the early church, I have listed there the baptism of Jesus being about 26 A.D. Uh, this chronology is not exact. It, it is what I have read over the years and found most reliable scholars to work with. So this is kind of a rule of thumb. It's not an exact measurement. But somewhere around 26. And his ministry went on for a little over three years. And they reckoned that his death was about A.D. 30. Now, after he died and Christianity started in Jerusalem, it was a Jewish thing. Uh, and for a long time in the first century, Christianity was essentially a Jewish organization. Uh, they read the Torah in their worship. Uh, they conducted things just like they would have in the synagogue, except they believed that Jesus was the Son of God. So if you went to a church... For the first 25 or so years of the church's existence, it would have been a very Jewish thing. Now, there was a guy by the name of Saul who was born in the little town of Tarsus up in southeastern Turkey. There's a region there called Cilicia right next to Syria. There's a fertile plain that goes up a river there towards some very beautiful mountains in Cilicia. And Tarsus is inland. It's not on the coast. It's inland up in that valley. This Saul was born there, was multilingual. He spoke several languages and was apparently very familiar with Syria, just to the east of there. Uh, he was Jewish. And as he later said, uh, he went down to Jerusalem and studied with the number one teacher of Judaism in the world at that time. His name was Gamaliel. And to have studied with Gamaliel was probably not like going to Harvard. It was more like going to Oxford and then being given an honorary degree by the Sorbonne in Paris or something. I mean, to study with Gamaliel was a big deal. He became a Pharisee, which is a uh, more on the open side of Judaism. The Sadducees were more of the stricter types. So he grew up a little bit more on the open side of Judaism. But when Christianity came along, this guy was really bent out of shape. He took the Christians on. Uh, he had uh, the approval of the high priests in Jerusalem to persecute Christians, and he did that with vigor. Uh, he... Uh, he would capture them, send them down to Jerusalem in chains. Men and women, the text says in Galatians, men and women, send them down to Jerusalem, and there they would be tried, they could be put into prison, and on occasion they were killed. This guy created mayhem among the Christians. Just the name Saul of Tarsus struck fear into the early Christians. And he did that for quite some time. Uh, during that early period, a man by the name of Peter was really uh, one of the big guns. Peter and a man named James and John were the three principal leaders of early Christianity there in Jerusalem. And they were the ones that uh, really built the Jerusalem church up and really began to have Christianity go into other parts on north up, up towards Syria. And it finally went even up into Damascus in Syria. Uh, there are stories from the later church about some of the early uh, disciples taking it to India and to Arabia and I don't know what all to Egypt. Uh, we don't know exactly how reliable those accounts are. That Thomas, for instance, went to India. It's a good story, but it came from two or three hundred years later. Uh, what we do know is that Christianity moved from Jerusalem uh, up into uh, Syria to the north. Damascus and Antioch and places like that had Christianity. But it was still Jewish and uh, did not have the, uh, uh, the non-Jews in any great numbers. Okay. 
somewhere uh, a few years after his uh, persecution of Christians, uh, Saul was on his way uh, up to the north toward Damascus to persecute some Christians. And on the way, he had a very strange uh, thing happen. A great light shined on him, blinded him. Uh, a voice came out of the, uh, you know, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you? And he says, well, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. About the same time, there had been a vision come to a guy up in Damascus with the name of Ananias. And the word of the Lord went to him, and he said, I want you to go down and get this, uh, deal with this Saul of Tarsus. He's, you know, he's going to become my follower. And Ananias, of course, says, do you know who this guy is? And, uh, you know, you sure you want me to go down there and deal with this dude? Uh, he was nervous as a cat here. Uh, but anyway, they, 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 they lead uh, uh, Saul up to Damascus. Ananias works with him. And in the process, this Saul becomes a Christian. Uh, that account is found in Acts chapter 9. Uh, at least that's the fullest account that we have of this. Now, uh, after he was converted, he says in the book of Galatians, it's in chapter 1, it starts about verse 11 and goes down through verse 17 of Galatians 1. He says, I became a Christian, like it says, and, and he has the story like it was told in Acts. And then he says, but when I became a Christian, I didn't go to Jerusalem to learn how to do Christianity. That Peter, James, and John. He says, I went to Arabia. And that's where I learned how to be a Christian. Well, now that's an interesting statement. Uh, Arabia is a big place. But uh, there, there are a couple of things that Paul mentions in some of his writings that make it pretty clear that he went across the Jordan River over into what would be called Arabia. And just down to the south of there, there's a place that you may be familiar with uh, called Petra. It's in the country of Jordan now. Petra is entered by going through a very narrow canyon with walls almost higher than you can see. And it opens up into a city carved out of red stone called Petra. Now, some of you younger ones may have seen that happen in, uh, oh, what was it? Is Indiana Jones. Okay, that's the old city. I don't know which movie it was. I've forgotten that. But, but that's the old city of Petra. Well, it, it was a, a pagan city back when it was built. But by New Testament times, when, when Saul was around, that was the number two center of Jewish learning in the world. Now, now, now Jerusalem was still the number one. And Gamaliel was still the big dude. But down at Petra, there was a great collection of Jewish teachers. And then uh, you, there is a, a mention, for instance, we won't dwell on this. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says to the people who are in the church in Corinth, you need to remember what happened to the Jews in the desert who rebelled against God. They rebelled against God out there, and 23,000 of them fell, or some such number, uh, fell in the desert. And as the reference is to the Old Testament thing there in Exodus. But now he says something in there about uh, they were following the wandering rock, or the following rock. Okay. Well, now, remember Moses in his story about... Uh, uh, smiting the stone and, and talking to the stone or whatever, and Moses got it backwards. Okay, there was this stone that mo created a problem with Moses. And, uh, uh, okay, there was this problem that he had with, with uh, Moses and the stone. In Jewish tradition, that stone was shaped about like a beehive, about so big 
that it followed the Jewish people through their wanderings in the desert, and that it still existed just outside the city of Petra and could be seen to that day. Now, that's old Jewish legend. But otherwise, how do you explain that odd statement in 1 Corinthians 10 about the following rock? Well, that was not a legend taught by the rabbis in Jerusalem. It was a legend taught by the rabbis out in the desert. It's typical of the kind of things that lead scholars to say, he didn't go to Jerusalem to learn how to do Christianity. He went out to this Jewish community to rethink his Jewish background. He has, he's been taught by Gamaliel. His world has been shaped by Phariseeism. What would you do if you had to go shape your world? He goes to a center other than where his teacher was to rethink what he's doing. And then he says, I went back to Damascus. One time, he says, I was down in Jerusalem for a few days. I met briefly with Peter, and I met briefly with James. And that was it. So what I've learned about Christianity, I didn't learn from Jerusalem. I learned it from God. Okay. Now, that much we know from Acts and from Galatians a little bit. Now, uh, he uh, begins, to get, begins to get very excited about Christianity, and he begins to preach. He preaches in Antioch, and people are nervous about him being around because he's still known as Saul of Tarsus. And when he shows up, Christians don't want to come out to hear him. So he has a bit of a problem here to start with about getting credibility in the Christian community. They're scared of him for a long, long time. But the more they hear him speak, the more they believe that this man has a message. And then the numbers start to turn. And they turn to the point that the church in Antioch says, we like what you're saying about Christianity so much, we want to send you on a trip over into Turkey. They called it Asia Minor at the time. We want you to go over into Turkey and carry this message to the people over there because you not only know the Jewish background, but you speak Greek like a Greek. Those people speak Greek like a Greek. You go share it with them. So he and a couple of his friends make this trip through these little provinces of Turkey. Uh, it takes a while. And I've listed here uh, the years 46 through 48 as being the years of that first trip. That account you'll find in Acts chapters 13 and 14. Now, after that trip, he comes back and goes down to Jerusalem, and they have a conference with the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. Okay, Christianity, as I said, is basically Jewish. He has been out in the non-Jewish world now for, what, two, almost going on three years, preaching out there? And he comes back to them with uh, a problem. They have a meeting in Acts chapter 15 to discuss this problem. But basically the problem is this. How do we take a message that is couched in Jewish language, Jewish concepts, uh, to a group of people who have a very different worldview? They don't speak Hebrew. They speak Greek. Uh, they, they, it's just a very different world out there. We're going to have to change some things about how we approach people. And that conference was a big conference about change. Oh, we don't like change all that much. But he says we have to change some things. So what gives and what doesn't is Acts 15. And they wind up with a letter being written by a man named James, who was Jesus' brother. James wrote a little letter for Paul to take with him to go back out there and says four things. You, you can work with everybody, but four things are non-negotiable. And there in Acts 15, he mentions, so we want you to stay away from idolatry. We want you to stay away from things strangled. Stay away from blood and stay away from adultery. Now, that may seem like four things. But in Greek, very often, when you have a series like that, the first one is what it's all about. The other three are examples of it. 
Now, we won't stop to illustrate some of those, but there are at least a half a dozen of those instances in the New Testament. This, I think, to be one of them. We want you to avoid idolatry. Now, <clears throat> the number one thing when a new religion is being embraced is what to do with the old one. So usually there's a little bit of both. Our missionaries go to Africa. It's easy to convert them to Christianity in many instances. The hard thing is to get them to give up on what they normally do when they get sick. When, you know, things happen, you had to go to the witch doctor to do this and that, you know, just to cover your base. You know? That's called syncretism. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Now, when you read Galatians, it's all about syncretism. In the central part of Turkey, there's a province called Galatia. It was very backward, and they had a little bit of Christianity and a whole lot of the other. And that's why he said, you stupid Galatians, you got to get rid of this stuff and just be with Jesus. You, know, you read Ephesians, read Colossians. Uh, it, it, Paul's letters are basically about early Christian problems with becoming Christians, but not quite. Or maybe I better say Christians, but not all the way. Okay. Paul says we face syncretism out there. We have to find a way to really get these people fully converted to become genuine Christians. And if we keep all of our major concepts in the Jewish way of thinking, we'll never get to first base with them. So we have to change. Now Paul goes out on his second missionary journey. I've mentioned that in 50 through 53 AD. That's Acts chapter 16, 17, and 18. He goes back into uh, that part of the world. This time, however, there's a difference. If you read in the book of Acts, the first missionary journey, and Paul talks about Jesus, you know what word he uses? Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. That's a Jewish word. It's a Jewish concept. When he goes out on this trip, read Acts chapter 16, 17, and 18 and how he talks about Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. He no longer uses the word Messiah. He's the Christ. Because Christos is a Greek word. And now he can put Christian meanings into that word and maybe help them understand more what it is. So he's got the right idea. He just uses different language now to talk about it. Uh, and people begin to respond. Churches begin to start up on that missionary journey. So he wanders uh, through southern uh, Turkey, winds up at a little town over on the west coast, on the Aegean Sea, a little town called Troas. Not, not too important historically, but he's, the text says he's at that little town, and uh, he's wanting to go to the northeast. You see, if you look at the map, and Turkey's up here, he's come across the southern coast, he's over at Troas, and he wants to go up to the north. Now, up to the north is the Black Sea. And there's a major city up there called Sinope. Now, Sinope had two deep water harbors. This is a big going Jesse of a town. It looks like a perfect place to go do missionary work. But he has a vision at night. He has a dream at night. And, and there's a guy from Macedonia, which is over across, over to the west, in Greek, in Greek country. Uh, you have to go beyond Istanbul to get over there. This guy's from, from Greece. And in this dream, he says, come and help us. When I was a kid growing up in rural Arkansas, we used to sing about the Macedonian call. Now, I don't know whether you remember that phrase in any of your hymnody, but oh, we did. We heard about the Macedonian call. Most every Sunday we sang that song. Okay, so Paul is kind of frustrated. He, do, he wants to go where he thinks there's a great mission opportunity, but he, he's, he's prevented here in this dream because the dream is from Jesus himself. So he says, okay, I've got to do this. And he gets his buddies together. He's gathered some others along the way. There's a young kid with him now called Timothy. 
uh, he grew up in a Jewish home. His mother and grandmother, we know, were solid uh, uh, Christian people. They were grounded in the scriptures. And scriptures at that time now would be the Old Testament. New Testament hadn't been written yet. Uh, on this trip, he, they get in a boat at Troas. They go to the north. There's an island up there called Samothrace. Stop off there. Nothing particular happens. And then they head to the west along that southern coast of Macedonia, uh, just out to the west of Istanbul. And there's a town there called Neapolis in the ancient world. There's a town there today that uh, some people still use by that name. And there's a lot of antiquities there uh, in this place. Uh, they get off the boat there, and they go north. And we'll talk about that more just a little bit later. They go north a few miles. There's a little town up there called Philippi. And that was where he preached his first sermon on European soil. Uh, we'll talk about that story later. Uh, but uh, he goes north there and follows a river around that comes back in to the south. There's a big mound there today. On top of it, the ruins of what would be called Amphipolis. It's, it's mentioned there in the text in Acts. They stop by Amphipolis. It hasn't been excavated, but the ruins are up there. You can walk through them. They follow on down to the coast, and Apollonia is down there, a little town, still a few uh, columns and whatnot from old Apollonia. Interesting in that you can stand there by this lake at, at, at that little town and look up across the lake to the snow-capped mountains of Bulgaria, and I'll tell you people, what you have here is a beautiful view, but that view rivals it. Uh, that's one beautiful little town there. Nothing is depicted in the Bible about what they did at Apollonia, just as they did there. Now, what they did next was they went straight west, and there's a huge Greek town called Thessalonica. Okay. From Thessalonica, they make their way on down south into Greece. Uh, Corinth is down there. Uh, he, he meets the Corinthian people, starts a church there. But on that mission trip, he's all over Greece. And on that trip, he writes a letter back to the church in Thessalonica. And then he writes another one. And that's First and Second Thessalonians, and that's the earliest we have in our New Testament from Paul, is First and Second Thessalonians. So if you wanted to read his writings in the order in which they were written, those are the ones that come up first. Read it and find out what issues he was dealing with there, and you'll see the kind of reason that he told the Jerusalem people, we've got to recouch this in a better message. So he writes first and second uh, Thessalonians at that point. He writes a letter back to the church in Galatia, which is in the middle part of Turkey. We now know that document as the, the New Testament book of Galatians. Those books were written on this second trip. Okay. He makes his way back to the church in Antioch, and in 53 to 56, he makes a third trip back over into this part of the world that is found in Acts 18 through chapter 21. And it's on that trip that he writes Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Uh, he returns to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 21 because of some issues that arise by taking a young man who had not been circumcised into the temple area, uh, offending the Jewish people, uh, he was arrested. He spent the next few years in prison down on the seacoast at a town called Caesarea. And then he spent the next several years after that in prison in Rome. And it was while he was imprisoned that he wrote the letters of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and the little letter of Philemon. So this letter uh, that we're going to look at this weekend of Philippians was one of the latter letters that Paul wrote, and it was written on his third missionary trip, after his third missionary trip, while he was in prison. We don't know whether it was written in Caesarea, on the seacoast down just west of Jerusalem, or whether it was written in Rome. It doesn't really make a lot of difference. But he does say in the letter of Philippians that he is in prison, 
and uh, it was written uh, during this particular time. Now, just for the sake of your uh, chronology, uh, apparently he was released from that prison and spent a few years back doing missionary work in this area. He was again imprisoned when the Jewish war against the Romans broke out in A.D. 66. Uh, he and a number of other early Christian leaders were rounded up uh, as being enemies of the Roman Empire uh, because the Romans saw them all as Jews. The Christians were kind of brought into this because they were perceived as Jewish. And their leaders were rounded up along with the Jewish leaders. They were taken to uh, Jerusalem, <clears throat> and according to the earliest evidence we have, both Peter and Paul were imprisoned and killed in, in Rome uh, in the year 67. Uh, now, that's just the earliest evidence we have outside the New Testament. So it would have been during that time that he was uh, released and traveling around there before the Jewish war broke out that he would have written First and Second Timothy and Titus. Now, that just kind of is a walkthrough of the little chronology that we have here. Now, Russ, you'll have to help me know when we need to stop for a break. Um, do I, can I go another 10 or 15 minutes? All right. Thank you. Uh, in, uh, uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, let's, let's turn over there to chapter 16, if I recall. 1 Corinthians 16. Uh, no, 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 Acts. Why am I in 1 Corinthians? I am 73 years old. That's why we're in 1 Corinthians. It's Acts chapter 16. Okay, that's Acts chapter 16. <clears throat> uh, the, the letter here is, uh, begins in chapter 16, verse 6, with that dream of the guy from Macedonia, come over and help us. Well, uh, they do, in verse 11, go past the little place of Samothrace and land at Neapolis. Now, let's stop right there for a moment. When you land at Neapolis, there are some ruins that you will see. Those are from the time of the Franks. Now, you may not know who the Franks were. Uh, they were not a bunch of guys named Frank. Uh, but, they, okay. but, but the Franks built all of that stuff. And that's basically from the medieval period. That had nothing to do with Paul. However, coming from that wall over, there is a, a road paved with flagstones about so big. They are irregular shape, but they're about so big. And the road is maybe 20 feet or so wide at that point. That's the old Roman highway. Now, now, back when the Romans took over these provinces over here, they had to have a way to get their troops easily from one place to another because the, the marauders from the north were coming down and creating all kinds of issues. So the Romans built a road from Rome all the way across to the east. Now, when it came past Thessalonica and, and it hit little Amphipolis, the town that was on the hill there, it could not go further this way because there's a cliff. It, it was rugged mountains right down to the seashore. Now, today, there's a modern highway that's been cut through there. But back then, you could not traverse that area. So the road went north along a little river that went up through here, and it came back around down at a little place called Philippi, which was about mm, 10 kilometers or so in from the sea. Now, Paul and his bunch come along this road, and, and they hit the place where the mountains are there. They have to turn north. You go over a little ridge, not, not a very big ridge at all. You can't, uh, uh, probably not over two or 300 feet high, uh, but you go over a ridge on that road, and as you get to the top of it, there's a valley that spreads out to the north. Uh, back in ancient times, it was a marsh. Today, if you look out there, it's very fertile farmland, green farmland. Uh, but back then, it was a no man's land of marsh. Okay. The uh, uh, road went along the edge of that marsh, and on the right-hand side of that road, the mountains went up. 
uh, back in the old days, those mountains had mines in them. Uh, the mines had long played out. Uh, There's no longer any mining going on up there. So you would walk on past the hills that are there, and you come to a place called Philippi. Now, Philippi is, is interesting. When you come into the town there from the south, there are all kinds of uh, buildings with uh, oh, marble columns and all of that sort of stuff over here. And there are tour guides there that will charge you a fee to go through all of that. Built in the third century. It, you know, Paul didn't see any of that. Okay, that, that's late stuff. Okay. Philippi was on the side of the road over here toward that little marsh. It wasn't very big. There was a city. It wasn't a square because it was like a football field. I stepped it off. It's right at the size of a football field. Okay? And it's paved with flagstones. This eastern side of it just has a road going along it. A few trees along there. Goodness knows what they had back then, but just a few trees. There are some buildings over on the far side. One of them they'll show you is a place where Paul was imprisoned but it's built by the later Romans, so probably not right. Okay, over on this side, there was a three-sided mall, a couple of stories high, uh, shopping center, great shopping center along here, and down at the south end, one of the first libraries in the world. It's a room <clears throat> about as big as some of your average guest bedrooms, but in there, they had uh, scrolls, they had clay tablets with impressions. Uh, it was a literary place. People there could actually read stuff. On the east side of this mall, <coughs> they have a, fan, a, <coughs> a fantastic public restroom facility. I mean, multiple whatnot, uh, water from the uh, river coming down, everything is clean. And then right out here, it drops off about 20 feet, and there's a little river there. Now, the river is like a Texas river. It's, uh, <laughs> who knows what it was like 2,000 years ago. But uh, you can't jump across it at Philippi, but if you go about 100 yards north of Philippi, you can step across it. You know, I mean, it's, it's not very big, the river there. And then the marsh is out there. Now, Philippi, it says in, in verse hmm, 12, was a colony. Okay, now when the Romans built that road, they built forts ever so far along that road. And a few of those places were designated colony towns because that meant they had so many uh, people from the legions retiring in Rome that they were out of space. But you could retire in a colony town and have all of the benefits as if you had retired in Rome itself. So it's just to say that this, this was not just a little wide place in the road with the 7-Eleven people. This was class. Philippi just had, and still does as a ruin, had class written all over it because they had people who had served in the legions in North Africa and up along the, uh, the Rhine River and, and whatnot. These people, hey, they needed a good place, and Philippi was one of those good places. So it had a large Roman population. It had a basic Greek population. Uh, what else can I say about Philippi? Uh, well, let's, let's do it in passing. In verse 11... It, uh, it begins a story of uh, them running into a woman by the name of uh, Lydia. Um, Lydia, was in her, she was a, a businesswoman. Uh, they used the little part of a shell fish that they could make a purple dye with, and they would dye cloth and sell it. Now, we can go buy purple cloth for the Rockies, shirts and whatnot, uh, and they cost the same as anybody else's shirt. But in the ancient world, it took a ton of work out in the ocean, as well as in the processing and whatnot, to make a purple shirt. Purple was a royal color, because only the fantastically wealthy could buy this kind of stuff. Well, she made this stuff, and was a, apparently a, a woman of some substance on her own. She wanted to learn about Judaism. 
Now, the fact that they, she and her women workers met uh, out by that little river to try to study about Judaism has led most of us to believe that there was no synagogue there, that there was no rabbi. To, if there had been a rabbi, they'd go to the rabbi to learn about Judaism. But there was no, sin, no mention here of a synagogue, no mention of a rabbi. They just want to know about, uh, you know, they're studying the Old Testament scriptures best they can. Paul runs into her and with her women, and he teaches her. She becomes a Christian, along with all of the women who work in her dyeing business. They become Christians, and, and, and that's the beginnings of the church in Philippi. Now, we know one other thing about this church in Philippi. It starts in verse 16. In verse 16, uh, they are in this public square. Now, a public square had all kinds of stuff going on. It is a bustling hubbub of a place. Hmm? Uh, in that hubbub of a place, there was a man who had a little girl who was... Uh, I don't know that the word demented would be the right way, but she is afflicted in some significant way. And they are using her like an organ grinder's monkey to make money. So she has no value as a human being. Uh, she is just a tool, uh, no worth. One thing, she was female, and the other, she was uh, in some way malformed. Now, in the Jewish community of that day and of Jesus' day, there was this statement, if you see someone who has this malfunction, kick them. Why should you be kinder to them than their God was? And you see, when the disciples were following Jesus, they had that same mentality, and it took him a good bit of work to get that out of them. Okay. Uh, but at any rate, Paul cures this little girl. Oh, by the way, Paul. His name was changed from Saul to Paul. One way to kind of help get over the uh, nervousness people had of hearing that name, Saul of Tarsus. But anyway, he becomes Paul. And, and, and they cure this little girl. Well, these guys now have their way of making money uh, dashed. So they go to the authorities and put in a beef and have Paul and his followers all thrown into prison somewhere. Well, they're in prison. But during the night, there's an earthquake, and uh, their chains are all loosed and whatnot. This guard there is about to commit Harry Carey because, you know, if he loses a, a prisoner, well, his life is at stake. Uh, Paul says, don't, don't do any harm. We're all still in here. And they have a conversation with him. He becomes a Christian. So now you not only have those people studying Judaism out by the creek, you have at least one Roman soldier who has decided to join this group. And you have, you don't know that this little girl and her family became Christian. You would think there would be some relationship. We don't know. Uh, obviously, from the later letter, there would be Jews, uh, Romans, uh, and Greeks involved in that first group of people. And when he writes a letter back to them, it's a multicultural makeup. And not just Greeks. It's a multicultural makeup, this church was. Uh, now, um, uh, let's see, for the, for the sake of, of time, uh, I think what we better do here is say, uh, let's go ahead and take our break at this point, Russ. Okay, as we said toward the end of the earlier session, this letter was written a few years uh, after he had been made a prisoner by the Romans. Now, whether it was earlier or later, we don't know. Uh, but when he came through this area, it was what, early 50s? So now we're a few years down the road, and it would be, what, seven, eight, I don't know, a few years later like that, that he writes this letter back. So the church is hardly a decade old when this letter is written. Uh, but, but, but it's been there a few years. Just how it has grown, we don't know. We can get some impressions as we read Philippians that it's a good bit bigger than it was at the very first. Uh, and, but we can also uh, assume that it was still a multicultural church. 
because of the Roman presence, which didn't go away, and because of the Greeks who lived there as part of their turf. Uh, and, and then uh, were there any Jews that early? Scholars differ whether the uh, Jewish faith moved in or not. What we do know is this. This was the first church on European soil. Up to this point, the church was essentially Jewish. Now for the first time, you run into a church that cannot be said to be Jewish in hardly any way at all, other than Lydia and her people who've been reading some Old Testament scriptures. Now, the letter begins uh, in, in verse 1, Paul and Timothy. Uh, most people read right over that. It is written by both of them. Although, as you find out when you start verse 3, it goes back to the singular as though Paul himself is the only one doing it, the actual writing. So it is more or less like Timothy is with him discussing matters and is involved in the production of this document, but he's not actually the one dictating it or doing it. Paul is the one actually uh, behind this document. Now, the opening part in verses 1-2 is very typical. Uh, he writes to the saints in Philippi, but he mentions along with the elders and the deacons, which is an odd thing because that doesn't happen in his other writings. For some reason here, he singles out the leaders of this church as being important readers of this document. It wasn't just an open letter to the church. Uh, the, the leaders really need to pay attention to this too. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now in verse 3 begins this prayer. Uh, I thank my God every time I remember you, always when I pray, making mention of you in my prayers, uh, for your fellowship in the gospel from the very beginning of it until now. Uh, now that's a very positive phrase, positive statement. And it's the beginning of the idea that Paul loved these people. This was the one church he had no problem with. This was his golden uh, group to work with. He just loved them. Well, read on in verse 6. Uh, I'm confident of this, that uh, the one who began a work in you will complete it. In other words, the, the work that's begun there in the church it's going to grow on and do what it should. I'm confident of that, he says. And it's right for me to think this way about you uh, because, and here the text can either read, I have you in mind or you have me in mind. Doesn't matter. Probably both of them are, are going on. Uh, you in mind. Uh, but in my chains. Now here's where we get the idea that he's in prison. Uh, on, on behalf, he says, uh, of working for, on behalf of the gospel. So he is a religious prisoner of the Romans at this point. Now, God is my witness, he says, I really long to be with you people. Now, that's our verses 3 through 8. And, and, and he's saying that essentially that's what he prays about. And where we get the idea that he is just fantastically in love with these people and them with him and it's a bed of roses. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it's not a bed of roses. And we're going to see very quickly here why not. But the question is, why would he go through all of this? I love you. I, I, every time I think of you, I pray. I can't wait to be with you. Ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. I said earlier, it sounds kind of gushy. Uh, that's not a theological conclusion. It's an old Arkansas boy's opinion. <laughs> okay. Why would he do that? All right. I have a friend whom I see about once every 10 or 15 years, and that's about enough. But we're good friends. We, uh, we have this kind of relationship where we haven't seen each other for 20 forever, but when we do, we pick up where we left off. Okay. And I know that he has my best interest in mind. And I have his best interest in mind. I try to have his best interest in mind. But over the years, on occasion, he has heard something about me. And when he does see me, he'll come up to me and put his arm around me. 
And he'll talk about how proud he is of what I'm doing. He'll talk about something or other he's read that I've published. He'll talk about some talk I've given somewhere he heard a tape on. He just prays this, you know, and I'm standing there waiting. And then finally he'll get around after a bunch of this goo, he'll get around to saying, now, Carol, I've been hearing, and he'll level with me. I can count on him to do that. He will level with me. A lot of people won't. They'll tell you what they think you want to hear. This is a good friend because he will level with me. You don't always like what he says. But I'll tell you this, if he's been hearing it, I need to know about it and I need to deal with it. He has a way. Now, I'm a kind of an old boy, as I said, from Arkansas. If you come up to me with your finger in my face and you tell me off, I'll bow my back. You had, you're not going to get me to listen to a thing you say if you approach me that way. That's just not the way you do it. And I've had that done. But this guy has a way of doing it because he sort of makes you feel like he really cares about you. And, and you know what he's doing. I mean, the guy's, <laughs> you know, he's not smoothing you. You know what he's doing. But you stand there and watch him do it. And when he finally says, now, Carol, he, he's got you. You're going to listen to him. You know, like I said, you may not like it, but you're going to deal with it. There's a way. Now, take my word for it. Something's coming up. And he doesn't walk up like he did to the Galatians and say, you stupid Galatians. That's, that's Galatians 1.3, isn't it? I think it's the third if it's not, it's close. I think it's third verse where he says, you stupid Galatians. Now, I don't know. They may have needed to be like we said in Arkansas. You, you hit a mule between the eyes with an axe handle to get his attention. So the Galatians might have been the kind of people where you had to do that. I don't know. On the other hand, he might have thought about it later and said, well, that's kind of a sorry way to go about it. I probably ought to be more smooth next time. You know, I don't know. By the time he wrote Philippians... He had his arm around these people. So I'm going to say that verses 3 through 8, he puts his arm around them. Now, the important thing is you don't go through there looking what he prayed about and say, oh, I need to pray about that. That's not why he wrote it. He wrote those verses so that when this thing was, and this is going to be read at church. This letter is going to be read at the church house. And everybody's going to hear it. And when it's read, he wants to have as many people out there that are listening as he can get. So this goo is very important to get the path smooth. He's not throwing rocks. You know, he's, he's, he's on their side. Now, look at the prayer. This is what I pray in verse 9. Here is his prayer. Now, let me say this before we get into it. Any time in New Testament writings that you run into a prayer, you better pause on that one because that's one of the two most significant ways that a New Testament writer can give you his point. This is not just tossed in here. When he says, this I pray, their ears perk up because they know, okay, smooth stuff's over. This is... Hey, Carol, time. This is what I pray for. And here it is. I pray that your love might increase more and more in all knowledge and all discernment. Then, in order that you may, uh, what, test the things that differ? I don't know exactly what your text reads there. In order that you... Put some, discern what is best, something like that. That's good. Okay. Then, in order that you be what? Two things. Pure people and undefiled or something like that. Uh, when Christ comes again. And then that you be filled with the fruit of righteousness to the glory and praise of God. Now, that's an interesting prayer. The first thing, it's not four things. 
It's one thing. He prays for one thing. Now, let's read it real close. That's the first thing. I pray that your love might increase more and more with all knowledge and discernment. Verse 10 says, in order that. So you need verse 9, in order that something may fall out. That, that uh, what? You may discern what is best. And verse 9, in order that you may be pure and whatnot when, at the day of the Lord. You know, in order that you be filled with. So there's one thing that your love might increase more and more in all knowledge and discernment. The other three are so that something else can fall out from that. Okay. Now, you, you don't go to the finding out what's best or discern what's best. You don't go to the, uh, you know, being pure at the day of the Lord. That's not his prayer. His prayer is that your love might increase in knowledge and discernment. Question. Why would he pray that your love might increase for one another more and more in all knowledge and discernment unless somebody had a problem with that. Is this just a, oh, this would make a good prayer topic? Or is this right off the bat hitting at the nerve of the problem in Philippi? Now, he's had his arm around her, but now he prays that their love might increase more and more. In knowledge and discernment, thoughtful love, discerning love. And why would he throw that in there? That they need to think about this. That they need to discern, which means there's better and worse way to do something. That's what discerning is about. Okay. Now, so I'm going to suggest in verses 9 and following, he hits the nail on the head by saying there is a problem in that church with love. All right. I mentioned that prayer is one of the two best ways to find out what a document from back in this period is like. We have just hit the first one, which is a prayer. Now, would you turn with me to chapter 4 for a moment? And we'll go to verse 2. This is the conclusion of the book, some say. Now, <clears throat> I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Verse 3, I urge you, true yoke fellow, get in there between them and help them work this out. Now, Yodia is a feminine name. Syntyche is a feminine name. Hey, Carol is a feminine name. Okay? But their names are more like Sue. And Johnny Cash's old song, you know, thank goodness you didn't name me Sue, because that is a pure D female name. Okay. Now, Euodia and Syntyche are two Sue type names. These are two women. Now, <clears throat> he says, I urge you, Euodia, and I urge you, Syntyche. He gives a verb to be. Okay. There are four verbs in the Greek language that will give you the point of whatever a writer is doing. What they, uh, the, the number one hardest one doesn't occur in the New Testament. That's a word that a general might give to a private. Patton talking to some Jeep driver. And he says, do it. And he doesn't care whether the guy likes it or not. You're going to do it and do it right now with no lip. Don't care how you think about it. There is a second one that is almost that harsh, but by choosing it, you put a little bit of concern into the mix. Not a lot, but you put a little bit of concern in the mix. Now, there is a third one where you say, I demand that you do it, but you have a good bit of concern. 
Now that's the verb that's used in verse 3, where it says, I urge you, true yoke fellow. That's that word. It's a, and the word urge here has nothing to do with suggestion or urging. It's a, it's a flat out command. All four of these are commands, not suggestions. But by using that one in verse 3, he says, I'm telling you to do it, but I'm telling you using a word that says, I really care about you, I love you, and but I'm telling you it's got to be done. Okay. Now, the one that is used in verse 2 with Euodia and then used again with Syntyche is a word where you wrap your arms around them. And you don't urge them to do something. It's like saying, okay, I'm on the plane this afternoon, and I'm leaving here in 10 minutes. We have this bill due day after tomorrow. It has to be paid. But you're going to use this word with her because you love her, you care for her. You know, this is a word that is a demanding word, but it is a word, but when you choose it, you tell the person, I care more about you than you'll ever know. Okay? So when you use that word, I urge in English or whatever you have in your Bible, it's a flat out command. There's no ifs, ands, and buts. Do it. But by choosing the word, it, it, we translate it in English as a kind of a more gentle thing like I urge you. But don't get the idea, as I said, that it's just an urge to do this. He's telling this woman, do it, and this woman, do it. Now, uh, it's like he grabs Euodia by the shoulders and says, Now, Euodia and Syntyche. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I was given this series of talks early in my career at a campus church near the University of Montana in Missoula. I had arrived there late. A little junior minister drove me to the building. I got out of the car, went right into the pulpit, and started this talk. Now, when I said, you odia, you, the congregation went, because huh! I was looking square at the woman that was creating all the trouble in that church. <laughs> and they almost fired that kid because he was the only one that could have told me, you know. <laughs> And I had to say, no, no, people, no. I just, I picked her at random to look at, like I did you, okay? Now, a few years after that, I was in a little small church north of Washington, D.C., in uh, the state of Maryland. The church met in a public library, and there were 18 people in that room that morning. And they met around a big oak table. And I said, now, you Odia and Syntyche? And I hit them both. I, both of the women in that little small church that were creating that trouble. And I just, so I've started saying, now, you odia, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. Now, you tell me if this is any kind of a contemporary book. These two women have had a falling out. Now, let me ask this question. It's just an old Arkansas boy question. Do two women ever have a private fuss? <laughs> no, no. Now, now, don't get, feminists, well, don't get on me here. These are two women. I didn't write this book. But they've had a falling out, and usually things are said or taken wrong or insinuated or sides are formed. And before long, the people on this side of the table in that little old church don't talk to people on this side of the table in that little old church, you know. And, and, and it, yeah, that's the way. You, why have a fuss if it's private? I mean, isn't that the name of the game? I'm sorry, am I wrong? Why have a fuss if you can't make something out of it? All right, these two women have had a fuss. And he says, I want you and you to get it together in the Lord. And my Greek Bible says to be of the same mind. Well, that doesn't mean they have to agree on everything. But the Greek here simply means get it together. Be, be of one accord as it were, okay? And verse 3, I want you, true yoke fella, whoever that is, get in there between them and help them work this out. 
Now, that famous verse that we have in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, is on the heels of what? And does it just mean what we say in devotionals? Or is it in a context where two women have had a falling out and he says, we got to get some joy in that church because it's all torn up. You need some joy. And again, I say joy. It's interesting how you can take a verse out of a context like this and make it mean whatever you want in a devotional. But if you leave it in here, it has a very specific meaning. And rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice, is in the context of a disrupted fellowship where the joy's been ripped out of it and he says you need it. I'm telling you again, you need it. Okay. Now, it was in the winter of 1963, 62, going into 63. I was a senior in college. I didn't join the little Timothy Club on our campus for junior preachers and whatnot, so I didn't get the choice places. I had to drive to a place up in southern Missouri, all the way from central Arkansas up into southern Missouri to find a little place that would let me speak on weekends. So I'm driving across. It's, it has snowed. Glistening snow. It was a beautiful drive. It was not deep. It was just beautiful. And ice on the branches of the trees. But as I drove along that morning, uh, that Sunday morning, <coughs> They had on uh, the radio a nationwide program of college choruses that would sing three songs each in their 15-minute period. Then another college from somewhere else would sing 15 minutes. And I almost had goosebumps on my arm. And there was a little college in Minnesota called St. Olaf's Choir who sang... Uh, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, and I mean the goosebumps just came out all over it. I wrote them a letter. I wrote them a letter and just said, you have no idea. I mean, it was, it was, out of Philippians, it was beautiful on its own. But now this weekend, we've got to leave that verse in here because this thing has fallen apart. At the front of it, he says, I want you to have more love for one another with all knowledge and discernment and at the end of this book he says you and you get it together in the Lord and you help them and you need to get some joy in that church now tomorrow we'll see how chapter 4 actually winds up this discussion but I've started it off and gone to the end to say I gave this talk down in Jackson Mississippi one time and a woman had just written a commentary, one of the elders' wives had written a commentary on Philippians as the epistle of joy. And I wander into that little congregation and say, it's anything but joy. They are, they are at, at, see, I didn't know she had written a little book. It's anything but joy. Well, bless her heart, she's a fine lady. She went on and fed me lunch anyway. Uh, uh, I was not asked back. Uh, but I would kind of rather go with Paul. Uh, and, and if you look at it this way, it's clear as a bell there's an issue here. Now let's go back to chapter 1 in the few minutes we have left, and we'll walk through what he does after he makes his prayer. Now the, uh, the book is going to divide itself uh, very easily, almost into chapters. Uh, we had the introduction uh, to the little book, uh, is uh, what, chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. But I'm going to indent out here, chapter 1, uh, verses uh, 9 through, what would that be, 11? 9 through 11? That's his main point. So as I diagram this, stuff further to the left is what he's hammering on. The verses further in are going to be illustrations or lead-ins or helpful stuff to get there. Uh, when we get down to the end, we'll have that I urge you, you, Odia, and Syntica over here at the same level as this. Now, the stuff in between has helped us get there. Uh, we're going to have three chapters before we get to that I urge you. As a formula in Greek literature, you have a background to the statement. You have that I urge 
and then you have to do something or other, and then you have for the following reason. That happens in all Greek literature, biblical or not. What's behind it? I urge you to do this, and this is his point, because this is what's really got me going here. Now, in, in, in this one, I, uh, he's, he's going to build up to the I urge you. See, this doesn't come until chapter 4, verse 2. Everything down through chapter 4, verse 1 is getting them ready for that. Now, think about it. Two women are going to hear their name called at the church house. You don't just do that. You, you lay the groundwork for that. In verse 9, he's got a prayer that's already tipped his hand. You need more love for one another. So they're thinking, uh-oh, this is coming, you know. Now, to get there, he's going to write chapter 1 and chapter 2. Now, look at the first part of chapter 3. He's going to say, Finally, rejoice in the Lord. He's headed there. But then he stops. To go over the same ground again is not difficult for me, and it would be helpful for you. So he writes chapter 3. He, hey, but, before I would call you Odia and Syntyche's name, I'd probably write chapter 5, 6, and 7 too. I mean, before you call those women's name in public, you better have your ducks lined up, Buster. You know? So he writes chapter 1 and 2 as the background to his exhortation in 4.2 to get it together. But then at the end of chapter 2, he's nervous as he can be. He says, I got I to gotta hit another lick here to get ready to say that. So chapter 3 is yet another attempt to get this audience of people to hear a very difficult statement. Because frankly, Euodia and Syntyche get it together in the Lord. I mean, if, if people are torn up about that, I mean, he, he just about blew up a bomb right there. That's serious stuff. It, it, it just in human relations, you can think about what that would be if you know two people right now who are really ticked off at one another and what would happen if their names were called in public at church to get this solved. I mean, that, that's tough. So I, I don't fault Paul at all for writing chapter 3, taking a second crack at this. But I want you to understand that everything we're going to do down to 4-2 is getting ready to say 4-2. All right, now we're going to watch how he does it in chapter 1. Uh, the first thing he does, and start in verse 12, this is going to go down through verse 26. Uh, 1, 12 through 26. He's going to talk about his situation. Uh, his situation is this, and we're going to skim through verses 12 through uh, 26. But he says he is in prison on behalf of Christ. Why is he in prison? Some people have accused him falsely of preaching some other stuff. And he said, I didn't preach that. But they've got me in prison on false pretenses. They've attributed stuff to me, but he says, hey, whether I'm in prison or not, I can make it. Uh, again, I will leave you to, to read down through that. Uh, uh, for, uh, verse 21 is one of those quotable verses. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Well, he says earlier, I could be killed by the Romans for what they have me in prison for. My life is on the line here, people. But if I die, it's not necessarily the end of the world. In fact, he says, I would rather go on and... I have met people whose lives have become so scrambled that they would say death would be the easier out. To stay here and face this stuff is more difficult than to die. And sometimes things can get so bent out of shape that priorities do get juggled. And Paul apparently is there. That, but he says, but I would really need to stay here because to try to help you people find genuine Christianity would be, that needs to be done. 
So he says, I'd rather die and go on and be with the Lord, but I'd really like to stay here and deal with things like this because it, it, it's what the church needs. Now, when we get down to uh, verse 24, uh, we, we've kind of got a, a, a paragraph focus there. I'm in prison wrongfully, but uh, I'm making the best out of it. And, and uh, uh, we're going to make it work. Now, in, in, in verse 27, we have a major conclusion to this whole paragraph that's up here. The conclusion down here is in 27 through 30. This is what he's driving for by giving his personal story. Now, the word in your Bible in verse 27 is only. Is that right? All right, now, is that right? Or whatever happens? Okay, most old translations have the word only there because that's what the Greek has. Whatever happens is a, a way to try to get that into some modern meaning because if you just say only this, that doesn't mean a whole lot of people like us. Okay, in Greek, here's how you translate the word only. All right, listen up, people. I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say it once, so listen up. That's what only does in Greek literature. The word monos does that. It just got everybody centered on what he's going to say next. So uh, whatever happens is a good way to do it. I want you to understand, however, that at that point, he just clapped his hands and got him by the neck and said, listen. Okay. Now, here's what he says. <clears throat> Conduct yourselves. And the Greek word here is as citizens. It has the word polis in it, like polity, politics, and so on. Conduct yourselves as citizens. Now, now over in Ephesians... He admonishes them, conduct yourselves worthy of the gospel. In, in, in Colossians, he says, conduct yourselves worthy of the gospel. He uses a different word, just for basic conduct. Here, conduct yourselves in that town. Question. If you have a church split going on, a church fuss going on, does it stay inside? No, it didn't take any long for it to get out in the community. And the community has field day with it. Just look at them. They say they're the only ones going to heaven. <laughs> look at them. Let them talk to one another. You know, that, okay. It's out in the town. And by using this word, he says, you're living in a little town that's about uh, hardly more than a quarter of a mile long. It's not much more than 150 yards wide. And in that little town, you people are having a problem that's gotten out, and everybody knows about it. Conduct yourselves as citizens worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or whether I just hear about you from a distance, that you are standing with one spirit. Now, that one spirit just, you know... Unified, what another unit that you are absolutely unified. Okay. Striving with one soul for the faith of the gospel. Verse 28, and not put off by your adversaries. Oh, there are adversaries in the little town of Philippi. Now, who are they? Well, it depends on which commentary you read. Most of them will say, well, they were Gnostic false teachers. Who are the Gnostics? Well, they were some bad guys back there that taught some weird stuff. And their false teachers came in here and turned them into Gnostic Christians. Well, that'd be good if the word Gnostic was used in this book, but it's not. There's absolutely no basis for saying that there was any kind of a false teacher in this book. No, no idea that somebody came in here and taught them something that they need to get rid of. It's not in the book. What you do have is two women who've had a fuss. That's in the book. And they need more love one for another, and that's in the book. And they need to have more uh, sense about how they go about living as Christians in a little town. That's in the book. And you have adversaries in the town. That's in the book. 
Now, what kind of adversaries do you need other than what Acts 16 talks about? When they started the church there, what did they do? Threw them in prison. They first started the church. These guys were thrown into prison. They had adversaries from the very start. The local people don't necessarily cotton to this church as much as they would like. So they have believers, but they have some tension with the townsfolk. The townsfolk have formed opinions about them, and they've heard rumors about them. They've heard facts about them. They've heard what they see stuff, and they form opinions and talk about them. That's adversarial. I'm just saying that the word adversaries here does not necessarily equal, quote, false teachers. That was common in commentaries back in the 1800s. And then commentators have been repeating that over the while to the point that it's almost become a part of interpreting the book. Now, my point is, it's not in the book. So let's go with what is in the book, which is this internal disruption. When he tries to get down to verse 2 to tell them how to solve the problem, he doesn't say, identify the false teachers, and you, Odia, and Syntyche, you are false teachers. He identifies them, but they have another problem. So, excuse me if I just don't talk anymore about false teachers at Philippi. Uh, I, I don't see them. The book doesn't talk about them. It's probably a figment of some scholar's imagination. Uh, maybe it came up on a term paper, and some guy thought that's clever and put it in his commentary. I don't know how it got started. It needs to stop. Verse 28, don't be put off by your adversaries. Now, if you have a fuss going on in a local church and people are upset with the local church because of this and things are being said and whatnot, uh, don't let that get your goat. Now, there, you can get so concerned with their reaction to you that you miss the problem, which is internal. It's among us. Uh, don't let concerns about them distract you, in other words. This is a parenthesis. The first part of 28, you can put parenthesis marks around it because it's a little inserted statement. He picks back up uh, his uh, point uh, about these uh, people. If, if you stand firm in one spirit, if you strive together with one soul, which by the way is a Greek exclamation point, in the Greek language you don't have an exclamation point. They didn't have one. You say the same thing two or three or four times, and that underscores it. In a Greek document, Greek manuscript, you can't underline it to make it more important because that's the way they erased things. I don't know why the Greeks didn't draw a line through a word like normal people do. They drew it under it. And we draw it under it to emphasize it. They drew it under it to X it out. So how do you emphasize? You say it two or three times. He said, what, stand one spirit, strive with one soul. He just underscored that unity emphasis. And he says now at the latter part of 28, that will be a sign to them that they're going to lose. What, the text says, what, a sign of their destruction? It means they're not going to win. Okay. Now, uh, 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 but of your salvation. Now, that doesn't mean gold streets and harps and angels' wings either. Uh, to win and lose here is in this current controversy. If they can solve this problem, the critics will lose. They will be silenced. And these people will win. He says they'll be saved. And he uses the word saved here like saved from a shipwreck or something. Not gold streets, but you'll be pulled out of this dilemma. And, and your church will be solid and good and healthy and the critics over here won't have anything to say about you. That's what's going to win and lose here. And he says in verse 29, because it has been given to you not only to believe in Christ, but to suffer for him. Now, I've heard that verse used out of this context all the time, too. Uh, a lot of people will say if you're a Christian, you're supposed to suffer. Well, uh, I... Uh, I taught for a while out in Malibu, California. And uh, my stars didn't suffer a minute. Uh, you know, uh, I, I have, uh, after my academic career was over, I spent several years doing humanitarian work in Africa. 
And you talk about putting your life in jeopardy almost on a daily basis out in the backside of uh, Kenya and Ethiopia and those places. I mean, it's a whole different ball game over there. Uh, it all depends on where you are. If you're a Christian in Arvada or Westminster, I don't think it's necessarily guaranteed that you ought to be out there suffering. Yeah. But if you're a Christian in Beirut, you're probably better watch your back. Because in that part of the world, it's been in Philippi, if you're a Christian in Philippi, because of the Roman presence and some of those early opinions of Christianity, you're going to suffer. If you're in Philippi, it's going to get you. So, it, with that in mind, he says, and you're going to have the same agony that you saw in me and, and now here to be in me. Now, this is why he told them his story. Let's go back and look at his story. He said, I'm in prison wrongfully. Uh, I'm about to be uh, sentenced to die as a possibility here. And he said, I have some struggles, some agonies. But how do I go about that? Well, look, look over in verse uh, 15, 16, 17 and whatnot back there. He says, even if I'm in my bonds, my chains... I still can talk about Christ to these people. Okay, now look, they put him in prison. He's got every right to be ticked off and sold up and angry and whatever. But what's he doing? Taking the high road. He's talking with the people. He, he's coming off as Mr. Joe Good. Hmm? Uh, his example in verses 12 and following has slipped up on him. Because when he starts out, he's in prison wrongfully. These people love him, and they can't stand the Romans. They'd go fight for him. But it turns out that his example is, I'm, I'm in the same boat you people are. I could be angry because bad things are being said about me. Euodia saying bad things about Syntyche. Syntyche saying bad things about Euodia. Other friends are saying bad things about them. And he says, I could be doing that. But I've decided to take the high road and talk about Christ. And that's what that's all about. So when he gets down here to the end, he said, now listen up, people. I'm just going to say this once. You people need to conduct yourselves as citizens in that town worthy of the gospel of Christ. You need to get your act together. If you do that, you've got a chance to win. If you don't, you're going to blow it all. So he says, yeah, it's been given to you to suffer. You're in Philippi. But now follow my example and make the best out of it. And let's get this thing together. He says, I'm trying to get my world together in prison. And you people start pulling together to get yours. That's where he's headed. Now you understand why he wrote chapter 1 and how it functions. He put his arm around him. He then gave a prayer where he told them exactly what he prayed to God, that they needed to have more love for one another with all knowledge and discernment. And he said, I'm in prison and I'm making the best out of it. And you people need to conduct yourselves as citizens in that town worthy of the gospel of Christ like I do in prison. That makes sense in terms of what chapter 1 is all about. Now, tomorrow morning we're going to start off with chapter 2. And there is a famous text in verses 5 through 11 or so called the Christ hymn. It's one of the people's most, it, it's probably is the most quoted passage of all things that Paul wrote. And we're going to start off tomorrow morning about why he wrote that. Now, uh, it, I taught in graduate schools of religion for over 30 years. We had chapel most of those days. I don't think a week went by in those 30 years that some student did not choose Philippians 2, 5 through 11 to read in chapel. I have heard that text more than any single text in the New Testament over my 30-some years of teaching. Now, why is it important? Well, for many reasons. 
tomorrow morning we'll be concerned about why it was important to the guy that wrote it. And that's a very different meaning from what we mostly get out of it. But thank you for walking with me through the first part of Philippians. It's maybe not exactly the book that you thought it was, but at the end of it, I think you'll find that this is one of the more important books that you've ever uh, read. And the reason why is that in one way or another, at one time or another, we sit in the same pew with Yodia and Syntyche. And we can make the same dumb choices or we can make the same healthy choices and get it together. It's about as contemporary a problem as we have in our modern world. So it was written 2,000 years ago, but if you let it have its own meaning, boy, it comes thundering down through the centuries as being a pretty contemporary book. Let's get back on it tomorrow morning. Thank you for coming tonight.